Villa. And yes, it takes place in Italy. After that, we're going to share our visit with one of our absolute favorites, Keenan Thompson. The SNL star is hosting the Emmys this year and updated us on his plans and his life. And later, a fun 90s look back with Hugh Grant. But first, his pop star. Let's get to it. We're starting off with Luckiest Girl Alive. We have an exclusive first look at the trailer for the upcoming best-selling book-turned-movie. It's based on the novel by Jessica Knoll. Mila Kunis stars as a woman who seems to have it all until her past comes back to haunt her. Take a look. I'm working right on a documentary about the incident at your high school. There are still so many questions that you've never answered. People want to know, were you a hero? Or an accomplice? Imagine what it's going to be like when they find out about what happened. How could you not tell me about this? I carried this horrible thing with me alone for years, and it has built up this rage inside of me. Mom, get out! Don't touch me! I don't know what's me. I'm what put I invented. Mm. Ooh, I want what I invented. Is that Ooh. what she said? That's a dark one. Ooh. I read that book Ooh. and yes. I don't remember anything <laughs> that happened, but I remember <laughs> it being good. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. Refresh your yes. memory. Wow. Um, you that can catch good. the full trailer on today.com. Mila will also join us on September 28th to talk about her role in Luckiest Girl Alive. Premieres on Netflix on October 7th. So there's still time to read cool. the book yes. before the movie. <laughs> All right, next up, Julia Roberts and George Clooney. The iconic pair is gearing up for the release of the upcoming movie Ticket to Paradise. They play a divorced couple teaming up to try and stop their daughter's wedding. Here's a peek. I think your things are in my seat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, come on. You've got to be kidding me. Excuse me, ma'am. I need to sit somewhere else. We used to be married. Worst 19 years of my life. We were only married for five. I'm counting the recovery. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking forward to that one. In real life, everyone knows Roberts and Clooney are longtime friends. The pair actually opened up to the New York Times about working together, joking that a single kiss between them took six months to shoot. It took 79 takes of us laughing, and then the one take of us kissing, Roberts joked. Ticket to Paradise hits theaters October 21st. That's going to be a good one. 80 takes. Can you imagine trying to do a kissing scene with one of your best friends? No. Like, that's just... And George Clooney is hysterical. Yes. yes right? I couldn't even imagine. All right, next up. Don't worry, darling. <laughs> darling, we're going to keep the movies going here. The psychological thriller. It premiered at the Venice Film Festival last night, bringing together the biggest stars of the film, Harry Styles, Florence Pugh, and Olivia Wilde. They all hit the red carpet alongside their co-stars to promote the upcoming movie. Now, as fans wait for the movie's release, we all know they're there have been rumors of a falling out between the lead, Florence Pugh, and director Olivia Wilde. Well, Olivia addressed, addressed the rumors uh, at a press conference yesterday. Take a look. I can't say enough how honored I am to have her as our lead. She's amazing in the film. And as for all the endless tabloid gossip and all the noise out there, I mean, the internet feeds itself. I don't feel the need to contribute. I think it's sufficiently well-nourished. <laughs> that's true. And that's that. Well said. Okay. Yes. Don't worry, darling. Hits theaters on September 23rd. Okay. Okay, next up, the NFL. We've been talking about it all morning. It's a big week for football fans, and we've got a lot to get to. So let's kick off with an exclusive first look at a new video from the NFL showing how the league is gearing up for this season. Okay. Welcome to the 103rd. We're trying to call out other people. Yeah, what is that? I saw Simone in that one. Well, you're you're not wrong because they're all in it. Simone's in it. Oh, Lil Wayne's in it. Sweetie's in it. Uh, they all teamed up for that legendary pep rally to celebrate the start of the season. If you want to watch the whole thing, wow, you yes, can we do. Go to today.com for the full video. I'm going immediately. And see that. It's fun. It gets you fired up. Yeah, right? it's, yeah. it's September now. Oh, yeah. We're ready for Let's football. Do it. Season. All right, and also making his return to the NFL, Tom Brady. We haven't talked about him in a few days. Uh, the star quarterback opened up about his decision to return to football on his Sirius XM show. Let's go. Take a look. I just felt like I had a little left, and I want to give it a shot. And I owed it to my teammates and uh, our great coaches and our whole organization. We built something pretty special here in Tampa the last few years. The competitive fire still burns. And I want to get out there and I want to have a great season for everybody because there's a lot of people that have supported me along the way. 
And if you want one more reason, yes. look forward to the NFL season. Yeah. yeah. Ozzy Osbourne. What? The He's rock returning? legend is set to take the stage during halftime at this oh. Thursday's season kickoff between the LA Rams and the Buffalo Bills. It's actually his first U.S. appearance and performance since 2019. Good. Of course, you can catch the kickoff game. It's this Thursday right here on NBC. Wait, a halftime musical show? Oh, I mean, the yeah. first game? Oh. There's more you need to know, starting with Andy Cohen. Everyone loves to show off their happy sun-kissed family photos after a good vacay. But our buddy Andy, well, he's keeping it real in a new video from inside the tough car ride home with his kids. And you just watched Bob the Builder for six hours while I packed the car up. You can't want to watch more. We're going back to the city. You've been wanting to go back to the city. What? Okay, okay. Do you feel better now? Um, no. I, I still feel good. Well, you what? I was just kidding. You were just kidding. <laughs> wow. Ah, uh, the many highs and lows of being three years old. Congrats to all the parents who survived this summer and cheers to going back to school. And finally, Leah Michelle, the multi-talented actress, is getting ready to take the stage as the lead in the Broadway show Funny Girl. Entertainment Weekly revealed these first look photos of Michelle as Fanny Bryce. As she prepares for her first show, Leah says she's over the moon and so nervous at the exact same time, describing the role as a dream come true. Leah Michelle's run in Funny Girl begins tonight at the August Wilson Theater here in New York. And that is the latest for you today. Coming up, the stars of Love in the Villa give us a glimpse into shooting in real life Verona, Italy. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. Wake up each other now. Doesn't it weekend. just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready. SG, you ready? We're fresh and reorganized for fall. Start today. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. What would you do if you arrived for a European vacation and your Airbnb was double booked? Well, that's what happens in a new movie called Love in the Villa. And two of its stars spoke to the fourth hour's Donna Farazin about shooting in real life gorgeous Verona, Italy. This is the movie we all need right now. We need romance, we need Italy. I love that you two, you know, you actually shot the film in Italy. What was it like being in that romantic and historic setting? It's yeah. incredible. I think we both said, right, that it's the best filming experience we've ever had. I mean, it's just incredible. It was a dream. It was an absolute dream. There were so many locations, the people, the food. It was, it was magical. Ah! 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 Who are you? Who am I? What are you doing here? I'm sorry, are you insane? You've just walked in here. Wait, she's... Uh, no, no. <laughs> I rented this villa for the week. Look, I'll prove it to you. See, Julie Hutton, house and host. Nice to meet you, Charlie Fletcher. Vacation day. I mean, when I was watching it and the characters, you know, at first you didn't want to be together, I'm like, come on, these two gorgeous people. I would totally be like, sign me up. 
to be overbooked with the, either of you two. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> Would you, in real life, if you were overbooked in a villa, would you stay or would you go? I would put up a fight. I'd be like, you gotta go. <laughs> Here with you after I just got dumped. No, I need space. <laughs> I, I'd probably like invite, I'd probably do what Charlie does later on and I'd be like, listen, let me cook you dinner. We'll go out, we'll have some drinks. You know, actually, what? because it's based on a true story because this actually happened to Mark Stephen Johnson. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. It was based off like an event where he went to Paris and met uh, a woman in a, in a in a villa that was an Airbnb. But they didn't have a romance, but they no. became really good friends. They're still in touch now. Well, nothing beats the romantic aspect of it. Um, I think everyone dreams of this type of scenario for themselves. Would you say that you, Tom, are more of a Charlie then? I'm probably close to Charlie, um, sort of in the latter stages of the movie, yeah. I mean, I'm certainly not as rude as Charlie is early on. But uh, in terms of like my planning and things like that, yes, I'm, I'm quite sort of, let's go with the flow. Don't worry about it. We'll just, we'll just deal with it when we get there. Kat, are you well organized or more go with the flow? What are you laughing at, Tom? Because I know. I know the well, answer. The best answer the question is you know. She is Julie. <laughs> well, you know what, Kat? Being Julie has gotten you very far in life. So congratulations. Compulsive successful is what I like to call it. Um, but I have since stopped planning as much. And I've learned to go with the flow. I no longer laminate my itineraries and I don't use my journal every day. So I'm doing better and better and better, especially when it comes to my personal life. There's so many elements in this movie. There's heartbreak, there's falling in love, there's being independent. Do you have any lessons in heartbreak, in dealing with heartbreak or in dealing with not settling? Yeah. I mean, like, Tom saying I am this character, it's not just the character. It's, I had a breakup. We got back together in Verona. This was years ago. My ex fiance's name is Brandon. Darren, my now fiance, is allergic to cats. There's There were things that were in, that, that the crew built in our actual villa. They had no idea it was the same thing I have in my house. There were weird things like that. Um, so, and I'm a spiritual person, so Me I think- Me too! I'm like, did you manifest this? What's happening? I think God uses my art as a way to get me to deal with myself or to teach me lessons, to deal with the things that scared me. If I could give anyone any advice, it's to just be open and stop trying to control everything and um, follow your heart. And it sounds really corny, but I've learned so much about allowing myself to just fall in love and, and be happy. Wow, Kat, I loved that so much. You know, it was so funny when I was watching the movie, I didn't realize at first, Tom, that your girlfriend was your wife in real life, Laura. <laughs> Sharing a screen and a set with her, I know that you've done this before, but in, in this romantic setting of Italy, like, what was that like? Oh my God, amazing. Um, just, I mean, it was the first time actually as well that we'd been away uh, together alone without our children for a bit. So to go away and do a movie together, doing the thing we both love was amazing. What are you most excited for people to see when they're watching Love in the Villa? I think, well, I kind of feel that Verona is a hidden gem of Italy, actually, for most people. I think when people go to Italy, they think of Rome, they think of Milan, they think of Venice. And for me, Verona is the one. It's, I think I, I want people to watch it and go, oh my God, is that what that city looks like? How are more people not going there? It's still relatively quiet. So I also hope I don't destroy it by having more tourism there because it's kind of beautiful because it's not overcrowded. Um, but it's just uh, endless sights, like sight after sight after sight and view after view. It's just incredible. Pat, if you could describe Love in the Villa, in a sentence or two, how would you describe it? It's a movie about 
conquering yourself and believing in destino. We should mention you can catch Love in the Villa on Netflix. Up next, the hilarious Keenan Thompson's visit to Studio 1A. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Thanks for sticking with us here on Pop Start Plus. Kenan Thompson always brings a huge smile when he visits us here on Today. And during his latest visit, he talked about hosting the Emmys, SNL, and more. Keenan Thompson has been making us laugh for decades. Yeah, he first broke onto the scene. Guess how long ago? <laughs> Keenan, guess. 30, 30 years oh, ago, starring in classics like Nickelodeon's that All That and the baby. Mighty Duck movies. <laughs> the tiny, oh, and they're my favorite right there. Today, Keenan continues his reign as the longest running cast member in Saturday Night Live history. Next week, Keenan will take the stage as the host of the 74th Emmy Awards right here on NBC. Keenan. You know what Savannah and I have been singing? What's, what's up with that? that? Oh, yeah. Keenan, what's mm -hmm. up with that? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hosting the Emmy is what's up with that? Mm -hmm. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Good morning. Well, good, good morning. morning. Good so, morning. what do you do? How do you get ready for the Emmys? Um, a lot of like phone calls back and forth to yeah. figure out like what it's going to be. But uh, a lot of joke writing. Like the writers are like really writing a lot of jokes and trying to figure out who wants to do bits and stuff like that. You know what, what I mean? What do you mean? Like other people are going to join you? Yeah, like the famous folks. You know what I'm Ooh, saying? Like uh -huh. who's, who's down like to so. do something funny. Uh -huh. Whoever's in the room, you know, we've been reaching out to a lot of different people. Um, all my, like, SNL brothers and sisters that'll be in the building, I'm sure, are going to be down for, for, for whatever. Uh -huh. um, but... It'd be nice for, like, you know, the elders, like the Sudeikis of the world to, to do some stuff. <laughs> the, the, the haters of the world, you yeah. know. Um, but also, um, you know, anybody. Like, like, I feel like, you know, we've been reaching out to people like Kamel and, like, maybe Lizzo and stuff I've been hearing. So these are all, like, you know, unconfirmed, but hopefully confirmed okay. kind of, like, things. Well, you mentioned Lizzo. We heard that you were hoping to do, like, a big musical number. Yes. Mm -hmm. How, mm -hmm. is, do you think that's going to come together? It's coming together kind of oh. well. I mean, I think you kind of got to have some music in the name. You know, it's just Grand State Academy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, you yeah, know, uh, something so grandiose. A, a little hint about what that might be? How it um, might look? What can the hint be without yeah. giving it away? Um, I, it, it'll be an, um, kind of an e eclectic gathering of tunes. If that, okay. If that's okay. A, a hint. Hint, hint, <laughs> you do you, by the way, do you get nervous before something like this? You do live, obviously, you do live television all the time at SNL. Yeah, I feel it. I mean, I try to turn that, you know, nervousness, you know, wordage into, like, adrenaline mm -hmm. or something like that or, you know, testosterone. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely feel I feel it now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, just knowing that 
you know, it's Tuesday now and Monday is approaching and yeah. blah, blah, blah. It's just like always on my mind. So I'm just like ready to get it done. Uh -huh. Well, you're going to crush it. Uh -huh. Full you. of faith. Thank and then you. You're, you have your, is it the 20th season, did we say, on SNL? Yeah, starting number 20. Oh, my oh gosh. Yeah, it's crazy, right? So, like, what? You're staying power there. You yeah, know, I think I saw you on the smart, or you were on the smart, smart list podcast, list. and you were like, yeah. "I'll stay forever." Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll stay till you're 100. Will you? That's yeah. my mentality. You know, like it's just nice to be asked back. That that's been this ongoing thing. Like, who am I to deny them when they call? You know, what <laughs> yeah. I mean? like it's such an institution, but you know, it's it's my home. You know, and it's it's nice <laughs> to have stability in life. So, <laughs> I just like you know keep. <laughs> you know, just stacking all these clips and, and looking back on it is the on. best. And these moments, I was just on Kevin Hart's podcast and we were talking about that sketch right there. Yeah. The Corner Boys. Uh-huh. And, you know, I'm just working with a lot of brilliant people like the Mulaney's of the world, you know? So, how do you, how do you know, like, how do you know how to do an Al Roker? Like, how do you even know how to do It's just what that? I, it's what I hear. Yeah. You know? So what do you <laughs> And like my, that? my kind of like, you know, if he was projecting, that's what I would be taking away yeah. from it. <laughs> but he's just so jolly. I was asking where where he is a minute ago. I was I like, know. where's Roker at? Can you, you know, he's just sitting out of such a presence. Uh -uh. And he's just so, he's always smiling. So that just makes <laughs> me feel like he's just very giddy. And he wants everybody to know what's going on in their neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. By the way, there's a, people love to write in and say, this is why I wish would be the guest host this mm -hmm. year, some special guest host. Yeah. Carol Burnett's getting traction. Oh, that Carol would be Burnett. amazing. She's never She's done it. Practice. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. What do you think of that? I feel like that's a crime. You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know, she's an, an incredibly brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, Carol Burnett actually presented me Miami when we won. That oh. was amazing. She was the, the uh, presenter of that category. And that was the first time I've ever even been close enough to even, like, Mm -hmm. Imagine touching Carol Burnett. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it was, it was an amazing but moment. But we gotta so hit one of She's got to do it. Yeah. yeah, you just got your star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I sure did. How cool is that? Wow. Gold star for the kid. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was an incredible moment. It really was. Like Meaningful? very touching. Whole family. Yeah. Leslie came out. JB came out. Look at the babies you kids. there. The it was, girls. It was the best. Yeah. It was. It was a great day. Yeah. It was, it was. It was. It was crazy to witness something like that and still feel so young, you know yeah. what I mean? It, it yeah. seems like such a end of the road kind of thing. I heard your neighbors but, with Lauren Michaels on the on the Walk of Fame. Right next, he was right next to That's me. cool. That, that's so crazy. Like we had, you know, half of his name covered up because of the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, slightly disrespectful. <laughs> but yeah, that it, it's it's just wild to, to think about, you know? Oh. Gotta love Keenan. And we should mention you can watch him as your Emmys host coming up on Monday night at 8 o'clock, 7 central on NBC. Next up, we're traveling back to the 90s with Hugh Grant. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, missing in America. Listen to the full season now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. Wake up each other now. Doesn't it just weekend. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready, SG, you ready? Refresh and reorganize for fall. Start today. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just weekend. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. Start today. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. Any Notting Hill fans out there watching, the 1999 romantic comedy star Julia Roberts and Hugh Grant, and in honor of Grant's 62nd birthday this week, a little something from the vault. His visit to today, all about the film. Hugh Grant, good morning. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. So this teams you up once again with the screenwriter and producer from four weddings and a funeral. That's right, yeah. Was it nice? Was it a nice reunion? Nice to be back with those people? 
Uh, well, it was. It was like getting back into a warm bath, you know, after uh, years in the wilderness of people, you know, giving me not such great uh, romantic comedies. And suddenly to have this great writing again was, uh, was fabulous. But um, having said that, it was very scary because suddenly it's a much bigger budget. I was going to say a and, much, uh, much, much bigger budget, well, right. right? And partly because we have this actress called Julia Roberts in it. Uh, which Who? Who? Someone called Julia <laughs> Roberts. She's good. You watch out for her. She's, she's going to be big. And, um, you know, obviously everything suddenly becomes a different kind of ball game. So it's scary in that way. The uh, idea apparently came from screenwriter Richard Curtis's brain. He was uh, <laughs> staying up one night thinking about what it would be like to suddenly have these two worlds collide, the, the most famous person in the world, which seems really right for a movie because so society is so obsessed with celebrity right now. Yeah. Get together with somebody who really doesn't have a clue about popular culture, right? That's right, a non-entity and a rather sort of, um, as you say, naive non-entity. When you heard about this, this plot, I know that Julia said that she thought, I don't think this is such a hot idea. What did you think when you heard about it? Uh, no, I think that's a, a fascinating idea. I've always wondered, uh, you know, if that can really happen. A very ordinary kind of guy falling in love with a very, very famous woman or, or the other way around. And um, I think a lot of people are fascinated by the prospect of that. You know, would the spark or just the basic charm or whatever that chemistry is, can that vault over this great divide in, in, in terms of, you know, celebrity? And uh, I like to think it can. And Richard, who wrote the script, hates me telling this story. And in fact, I'll get into trouble for telling it again now on national television. But it, it did happen to a friend of his who was just an ordinary English guy shopping in Harrods, big department store in London. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so no I never know what people know. I mean, I know what you know. It. Yeah, but you're right. A lot of people know um, that. So. And who met an unbelievably famous person whose name I can't reveal. Oh, come and on. Ended up, <laughs> no, that's why it's a sort of boring story as well as a naughty one. Uh, and ended up having a, a fling with, with her. And that became the basis or the germ of this film, I think. What was it like working with Julia Roberts? Were you at all intimidated at the prospect, or did you all get on immediately? No, I think we were all terrified, um, especially me. I mean, I had met her many years ago and, uh, when she was going to do a film in London, and I was a sad, unemployed actor. And, um, I was one of many sad, unemployed <laughs> actors who she rejected, threw away like so much trash for this film. But uh, we got on very well at that thing. And, uh, I knew it would be all right in the end in this film, but I, it, didn't make me, it didn't stop me from being unbelievably nervous when she first showed up. I was talking to her about the other actors uh, in the film, too, and uh, how important they really are to the whole mood yeah. of the movie. Um, were, were these people, she didn't know any of them before this film because right. they're all British, but were these people you knew or had worked with at all? Or? Um, I hadn't worked with them, but I knew who they were because they're all big uh, TV stars in England or... Yeah, you know, well known in, in, in England and uh, as you say they're very important to the whole thing it's like Four Weddings and a Funeral it was like a sort of ensemble piece up to a, up to a point and uh, Richard Curtis the author of the piece is very keen on friendship and on um, I don't know just on a whole sort of bedrock of, of good supporting characters and there's some hilarious performances the guy who plays my uh, flatmate, my roommate in this, is uh, particularly hilarious. He is very funny, isn't yeah, he? Yeah. Um, you know, some people have said, here's Hugh Grant, once again playing Hugh Grant. I mean, you've heard <laughs> this a million times, Hugh. And, mm. and, and it must be frustrating for you to, to read that or hear that. You know, well, once again, he's playing <laughs> the affable, bumbling, romantic, right, lovable, right. shy, self-deprecating person. Yeah. What do you think when you, when you hear that or read it? Well, you're right. It is vaguely frustrating. I mean, because to anyone who actually knows me, um, I'm not that person. I'm, I'm a lot nastier than that. Uh, <laughs> Plus, in, in fact, I mean, for years, I, I, all I did was villains um, for all the way through the 1980s. And in these kind of situations, these interviews, people would say, why do you always play villains? Why are you always the same thing? So I think people like to hang you on a hook as an actor. It just so happens Richard's written two parts, which are actually rather like him. He's the author. And I just sort of ape him. And those two happen to have been the most successful that I've done. And there you have it, today's Pop Start Plus. And as always, we'll have much more for you tomorrow. Until then, take care.
Well, it is that time again when we trade the swimsuits and long summer nights for, for textbooks and early wake-ups to make the school bus. Back to school is here. So we're dedicating the next 30 minutes to help you successfully navigate the return to school for, for college, high school, middle school, and where we will begin, kindergarten. Full transparency, this is also uh, quite the personal episode because my daughter's an upcoming kindergartner, so we're sort of navigating all of this at home right now. Founders of the wildly popular advice platform, Big Little Feelings, Kristen Gallant and Dina Margolin, they're here with me. They're gonna answer all of our questions. First though, what are these five-year-olds, what are they feeling about school? Well, we sat down with a few upcoming kindergartners in Seattle at Seed Early Childhood Center to find out. Take a look. Yep, you can just sit down right in that chair. My name is William. My name is Ben. My name is Layla Jameson. So hall Ben is the, and I'm going to start, uh, I can't remember. Kindergarten. 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 I'm starting kindergarten this fall. for bigger kids. I don't know what it's like, but I really hope it's gonna be the best time ever. It will be like much different. I'm excited to ride the bus to school. I think I'm going to see like awesome stuff. I forgot what I was gonna say and I don't remember anyways. That's okay, that's okay, don't worry. I feel excited to be starting kindergarten. I think I'll learn how to help other people. I'm gonna learn how to read and to write. Math. I do like snakes. Art and acting. Beep boop boop. I am a robot. <laughs> I know all the ABCs. Really? Huh? That's awesome. Can you tell us? TV. And W, X, and Y, and Z. Even though I know a lot of rules about baseball, there's some rules and some stuff where I don't know about it. I think I mostly just want to read about dragons and unicorns because they're my favorite. Of playing alone. No, I'm not scared of anything. Well, I, I'm kind of scared that they're going to ask me to read by myself. It's going to be pretty weird. Not to be shy, I'm going to make friends. It won't be exactly the same as preschool, but it's for kids my age. That they want me to read. Read really good. So I can play all the video games. Can I just be done? Yeah, we can be done. All right. Thanks, Anyone watching that? They'll be amazed. <laughs> All right. Very cute kids there. Very cute. But uh, also some nerves in this big transition. Child therapist Dina Margolin and parenting coach Kristen Gallant, they started this Instagram account called Big Little Feelings to provide parents with helpful advice for their little ones. And that little Instagram account now has about 2.6 million followers online, so we decided to invite them here. Kristen, let me start with you. Does it matter if your kindergartner can't count or can't say their ABCs yet? How much of a concern should that be? Right, and I can speak from experience. My oldest is going into kindergarten, and part of the back of my brain is like, is she reading on time? Is she doing it? Right. The answer is no. It does not matter if yeah. your child can read or do the ABCs or if they're a little bit behind their cousin or whatnot. The skill for readiness that we really want to teach for kindergarten or in advance if possible is independence. And what that means is things you would never normally think about. Can they open their lunchbox? Can and they say, hey, I want the juice. I need to go to the bathroom. So independence, that's what we really want to focus on before. Separation anxiety. Yeah. That is something that a lot of parents and, and children struggle with, especially yeah. on the first day or in those first few days of kindergarten. 
What, what do we do about separation anxiety? New things are scary. And when we're scared, there's more emotions and more meltdowns, more crying, more clinging. So the one thing we want to do here again is prep. Help them understand what's going to happen so they feel more comfortable and more safe, which means more calm. So for drop off, for example, we're going to walk them through what they can expect. I'm going to drive you in the car. We're going to get to the school. Your teacher's going to open the door and help you out. I'm going to give you one hug and say, I love you. Bye bye. And then we have to really follow through with it because if we waver, if we linger, it sends a message to their brain saying, wait a minute, she said I was safe, but now she looks panicked. Uh, What's happening? Panic, right? Uh, so if we're confident again, we follow through, they'll feel safer. When they do start kindergarten, what, what should parents expect in terms of changes in emotions, changes in feelings, maybe even changes in, in, in behavior? Yeah, we can definitely expect, especially after school, more meltdowns. And they don't have the capacity to be like, hey, it was a really long, hard day. Like, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Right? We're just going to see more crying. We're going to see them being aggressive with the baby. Right. They might be upset over ridiculous things like a crayon breaking. It's actually a compliment, and we like to think of it this way as an adult. When I've had a long, hard day, yeah. and my boss is riding me, yeah. and the gas station broke, whatever it may be, yeah. when I come home, I don't calmly turn to my husband and be like, honey, it's been a hard day. I lash out at him. That's I'm true. sorry, honey. I you know, it's just like kids. So we're just supporting point. them, right? Because they've been yeah. bottling it up all day. If you're their safe person. They're going to yeah. take it out on you or with you yeah. because they feel safe now. Thank you. Thank you, Dina and Kristen. Thank you so much. Uh, when we come back, Chanel is going to take us to middle school. And then later we'll go to college. Al's going to get some answers, answers for his own life on how to be an empty nester. Stay with us. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Welcome back. I'm Chanel Jones. Our conversation continues with the adjustment to middle school. The kids are now switching classes, their hormones are raging, and social media is on the rise. One of New York City's largest after school and summer programs, New York Edge, strives to make this transition easier. The program helps sixth graders improve academically and support them socially as they adjust to middle school. Take a look. Don't be a fool. Take sixth grade and seriously. Pay attention. Don't pressure yourself. No matter how easy it is or how hard it is, always try your best. Words of wisdom for the incoming class of new middle schoolers from rising seventh graders. Lessons learned from experience. Sixth grade, it was fun and complicated. The fun part was the fact that I got to see most of my friends after quarantine. And it was kind of hard because of the schoolwork. Last year, Corey Tolliver began middle school after nearly two years of remote learning. I had thought like it was going to be easy, but then once I got to sixth grade, I had found out that it wasn't that easy and I had to focus more. To help with the transition, Corey took part in New York Edge, a free after school and summer program that serves thousands of students. Its curriculum centers around what's being taught at school and helps kids like Corey and his classmate Aiden Lawrence succeed academically. Working in elementary school was easier. The work in sixth grade was kind of hard, but I understand it now. 
And for Caleb Tikasing and Jada Chance, the impact of the program staffers goes beyond schoolwork. Something that was really helpful was my counselors because they were always boosting me. Caleb, how's it going for you? Good? Even though some of us don't listen, I think that they've came a long way with us. Everyone here signed in? All right, perfect. We'll get started soon. The program also offers students access to a wide variety of enriching activities. That's money right now. That's money. You got to stand one step closer. If I was stressed or if I had anxiety, I would go to basketball or any type of sport because it just helps me stop thinking about that stuff. But perhaps the biggest impact of all is the peer community that New York Edge fosters. When it's hard, they'll always like have your back. They will always be there for you. A great program to help these kids adjust. Someone else here to help these kids and parents, child and family psychologist, Dr. Jen Hartstein. Welcome, thank you for talking with us this Thanks morning. Thanks for having me. I feel so many parents right now just glued <laughs> to ready. the monitor just to hear what you have to say. So listen, New York Edge obviously is a fantastic program, um, but not all schools have programs like this. So how can we as parents make sure that our kids transition to middle school is as smooth as it can be? And it's gonna be challenging, right? This is a big change for many people. And I think that's the word of the day when we think about middle school is change. And I think the most important thing to do is talk to your kids, sit mm -hmm. down, talk to them, ask them what they're excited about, ask them what they're worried about, ask them how they're feeling in general, and really listen. And I think as adults in the lives of children, we use our own experiences to kind of help them. But this is their experience, and I think it's really important for parents to remember this is their experience. Don't think about how middle school was or wasn't for you. Maybe use those stories as mm -hmm. anecdotes, but let this be their experience and kind of sit and validate and hear and just be present and really like kind of be their hype man. What Get them excited about what might be coming because we don't really know what it's gonna look like. That's really good advice. I think a lot of us, it's not that we don't talk to our kids, but I never had like a conversation about, hey, things are gonna change for you. So yeah. I think that's really good advice. Can you talk about some of the biggest emotional and social um, challenges and academic differences that exist between elementary school yeah. and middle school? Yeah, and there are a lot. I mean, I think academically, we can think about the fact that most of the time, K through five, you have one teacher mm -hmm. and you stay in your desk and it's your desk and it's your space. And middle school, all of a sudden, we're changing classrooms. We have different teachers and for kids who maybe aren't so organized, that's mm -hmm. really hard. Yeah. And so we have to remember kind of how can we give them some strategies and some help in that area. Socially, are we changing schools? Are there new friends? Clicks develop. Old friends might not stay your friends because there's this new kid that they really are excited mm -hmm. about. Or you kind of join the basketball team and have a whole new social group. So there's more opportunities socially in middle school, good and bad. Have you been spying on me? Why are you telling me? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I live in oh your. I God. secretly live in your house. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question. I know a lot of people can relate to this. So let's say after the first few weeks of school, are there any signs to let you know, you know what, maybe they're not transitioning well? Yeah, I think we have to remember that emotions exist on a continuum. Most kids start with, my stomach hurts, my head hurts, I don't feel good. Most kids mm -hmm. don't necessarily know how to say, I'm really nervous, or I'm having a really hard time, or my That's friends good. aren't my friends anymore. Okay. So think about the somatic things that they tell you. Okay. And also, like, are they just not interested? Do they seem to be like taking their time in mm -hmm. the morning? And it's not typical adolescent taking their time, it's like dragging their feet. Mm -hmm. You're pulling them with a rope kind of to get out of the house. You know your kid best if your gut is saying something's up, chances are you're right, so listen to that. And don't be afraid to ask, hey, I'm worried about you. You don't seem okay. Yes. And then zip it, be quiet, and let them tell you. Thank you so much. Well, coming up, how to help your kids avoid academic burnout, plus rules, boundaries, and securing a close relationship with your teenager. Woo! Stay with us. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky,
To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks. It's not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just feel good to be back to school? It does. Yes. Start today. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News. Streaming free now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline. Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. The transition from middle school to high school can be overwhelming for some students and an exciting new experience for others. We checked in with four rising freshmen in New York City to hear their hopes, dreams and worries for the upcoming school year. Take a look. I'm looking forward to finding new friends. I'll be able to try new clubs, especially since I like to dance. I will join for the dance club. I'm most looking forward to the sports part of high school because I'm a basketball player. Well, I feel like everything is something to be nervous about. Definitely the different classes and like traveling through the hallways. I've heard that teachers are really strict. The seniors because people say that they like to make fun of their freshmen. I have no idea why, but I'm definitely scared of that. The first one that comes to mind would have to be High School Musical. I really hope it's not like that. I don't want to sing everywhere. That's really weird. I always feel like there's going to be that one crowd where it's always like the it girls, the popular ones, and there's always going to be that little group where the nerdy squads, which I would fit in. You can't sit with us! I feel like high school is going to have more teachers being on you with more work. In one class, you could be with, your, with one friend, but then the next class, you're with someone who could be a junior. I feel like in high school, because you have that freedom, you really, you, it's your choice if you want to follow the rules or break them. My mom, she would always tell me to not follow other people because like when you follow other people, they could lead you to bad situations. So it's better you just, you know, stay your own ground and be by yourself most of the time. Be smart with who you hang out with because it really depends. And if I hang out with a bad crowd, they're gonna make me do bad things. If I hang out with a good crowd, they're gonna make me succeed in life. John Burnett is here with me to help us navigate it all. He's a school counselor from Houston, Texas, with over 12 years experience working across education. This year, he was a semifinalist for the Texas School Counselor of the Year Award. School counselors are some of my favorite people on the planet, so I'm happy to have you yeah. here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for what you do. So let's dig in here. So you think high school, you automatically think football games, <laughs> standardized tests, maybe yes. a little romance here and there. But I think it's important for us to talk about personal and emotional developments yeah. for high schoolers. How does it change when you get to this age? That is such a crucial time in their lives and there's so many things that are going on. Uh, they're being introduced to academics, of course, they're into a brand new school building and so there's a lot of different changes going on and it's really important for them to understand that they have a support system. First of all, before they even get there, which is why it's a good time we're running this special, yeah. how can parents prepare their kids if their kids are going into this, this set of life? I always say that it's a good idea for families 
families to sit down and create goals for their students. Mm -hmm. um, just listen to them and figure out what they want to do. Because of course, with high school, they're going to be introduced to a lot of different classes. Of course, they're going to have their core content area classes, but then they have electives so they can choose all their interests. So if they're interested in painting or art, they can go into that field and figure out if that's what they want to do with their life. If we're talking to our kids, they're figuring out who they yes. are. What does it look like at its best? So I always say that it's important for a, for a, a student to feel like they're a part of the community. Mm -hmm. And one way to do that, especially going into a new building, is joining clubs, um, doing uh, like art, music, band, joining the choir or theater. There's so many ways to get involved in school so that you actually feel like you're a part of the community. That's going to make the transition to high school so much better, and it's going to be easier for that student and the family, honestly. I think it's really good advice. When you're isolated, that's when some of the troubles start. It does. John Burnett, thank you so much yes. for your time. Thank you. Coming up, Al's youngest child goes to college. Stay with us. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. Wake up each other now. Doesn't oh, it just up. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready. SG, you ready? We're fresh and reorganized for fall. Start today. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. I'm Al Roker. Now we're going to end with one of our kids' biggest milestones, college. Not only are our kids moving on, but for a lot of them, moving out. It's a big transition for young adults and parents, including me. My, my youngest son, Nick, is leaving us this fall, making Deborah and I empty nesters. Well, Natalie Kane experienced this firsthand when her daughter left California for Skidmore College on the East Coast. Overwhelmed with the emotions and change that come with her only child going off to school, she sought help for her own life, but quickly realized she wanted to help others. And within a few months, her organization, Life in Transition, was born. I have to keep reminding myself it's a positive transition nonetheless. And she's our baby. And this is really hard. Friends said, oh, you better get used to being an empty nester. These families are part of an empty nest support group facilitated by life transition coach Natalie Kane. Empty nest syndrome is a time of curiosity and grieving. And each family is unique in the way they experience this stage of their life. Natalie came to this work in 2004 when her only child, Rachel, was a senior in high school. I was at a parent meeting with the headmaster principal and he said, okay parents, you're gonna be empty nesters and it's gonna be hard. And I went, oh my God, I think I'm gonna start a support group for us, would you come? Natalie's first support group consisted of seven soon to be empty nesters. They met once a week as all of their children navigated the ups and downs of the first year away from home. And then the mother said, you've got to open this up for everyone. You've got to build the website and you've got to put this out there so other people have support. Natalie did just that. She left her career as a speech therapist to focus on her newfound passion. 90% of the parents, when they would call, would ask me, is this normal, Natalie? Why am I so down? Why is it I don't want to do anything? And why do I feel so lost? Nearly two decades later, she continues to run empty nest support groups virtually and in person. One of those community members, 
Amy Western. She found Natalie after struggling with loneliness and depression during her daughter Sasha's first year away from home. Friends had warned me about it. They said, oh, you know, you're going to be all alone. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I realized in the middle of the school year how much it was affecting her. With the help of Natalie's empty nest support group, Amy has found coping strategies. To focus more on what I truly want to do, what I've ultimately wanted to do since college is join the Peace Corps. So I'm now looking into the Peace Corps and, um, and we'll see. Through her support groups, one-on-one -on -one sessions, and speaking engagements, Natalie has been sharing her wisdom with thousands of families, reminding us all it truly takes a village every step of the way. A tip for you maybe is what worked for me and some of the other parents is to know that you really can trust them. You've taught them your values, and if they really need help and something's up, they're gonna call you. Well, I give you all a big hug. We'll be in touch again soon, and thank you for being with us today. Thank Take you. care. Natalie. Someone else ready to help? Harlan Cohen. He's the author of The Naked Roommate and 107 Issues You Might Run Into in College. It's part of a series of books that he's written that looks at college life with advice for both parents and students. Harlan, good to see you. It's, great to, it's great to be here. Uh, what's your first piece of advice uh, for parents who are going through this for the first time? This is a big change for everyone, mm -hmm. and I think especially for parents, uh, they're so used to being part of their kids' lives, right. then all of a sudden they're far away. And this idea of getting comfortable with the uncomfortable is really the theme. The idea of renaming this first year the getting comfortable year mm -hmm. so that the expectations are that you're going to go through some transition and everything's not going to be perfect because this is a big year of change socially, emotionally, physically, financially, academically. Right. And if discomfort's part of it, it makes it easier for your kid to navigate this change. You, you talk about like the three P's, uh, people, places, and patience. Uh, yes, it's really important for a student when they're going to school to think, okay, where are my places? Places are where I'm gonna sweat, play, pray, live, learn, lead, love, work. So places are where we share experiences with people mm -hmm. and we build friendships and relationships. Sure. And then who are your five people? Who are the people who are gonna be in your corner? We're talking advisors, we're talking therapists, we're talking upperclassmen, we're talking anybody who is a peer leader. And then patience, this idea, it doesn't take two weeks or two months. It could take a good year for a student to really find their way in their new surroundings. You know, one of the things that I, I know, look, I've been guilty of, we, we want to solve our problem, our kids' problems, you know. That yeah. We've been kind of used to that, uh, but now they're going to be on their own. When your son or daughter calls and says, oh, this happened or that happened, yeah. what's the best way to approach that? Okay, the first thing is uh, you decide if you want to answer the phone. Okay, <laughs> that, that's important. Caller ID is a good thing. Right, sometimes you just don't want to be bothered. But then if you pick it up, you could say, uh, are you looking to vent if they're having an uncomfortable situation or are you looking for advice because a lot of students just want to dump their problems on you and vent but then if there's a problem it's the 24-hour rule as long as it's not you know life-threatening sure. an emergency uh, but just giving it 24 hours to let them process and if they have a hard time with that reminding them who are your people where are your places how often do you do a check-in you know, yeah and I, I assume that depends on the kid. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I don't think there's any rule. It's more of a question with Nick. And I, and I like starting the conversation with the, with the student, with the, with the kid, and saying, hey, how frequently do you want to check in? Mm -hmm. Because then they have the power to tell you. And also if they say, never, that's important. <laughs> if they say once a week or twice a week, and they're texting you every single day, well, all of a sudden, wow, that's interesting. So at least having a minimum, starting with them, and then saying, you know, I'd love to check in you know, a few times a week, or we can text a certain day. Parents have to be flexible because student schedules are moving, and if your kid has to talk to you and can't be in a room doing cool things with interesting people, then that's not really serving anybody. Right. Uh, so lastly, uh, and, and I, I don't mean to name drop, but I, I had an opportunity to interview President Obama. I took the opportunity to ask, 
what did you do when you dropped, you know, the girls off for the last time, you know, or for that first time? What was that? And he said, here's what I do. You drop them off and then you run, make sure you're near the car and then ball your eyes out. Uh, uh, what, what's your advice uh, to parents who are going to be doing this, who are going to realize yeah. this is the last one? It's an empty nest. Uh, I've, I'm feeling I've got I've got a 16 year old, so it's getting close. You want to show emotion, but you don't want to show so much emotion that you need to be taken away in an ambulance, okay? <laughs> because then you're the center of attention. Some parents are just cold and the kid's like, don't you love me? So this idea of finding a happy medium, but also not making it so you're so distraught that you become the focus because it's really about your child and yeah. them having their experiences. Well, Harlan, the great advice. Harlan Cohen, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And we want to thank you for joining us. Good luck to all the kids, all the parents out there. Start in school. I'm Al Roker. We will see you next time on Today All Day. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crab. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping vine of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty and savory all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you gotta think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy. You can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. So good to see you. <laughs> How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. <laughs> Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. 
Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five minutes and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886 started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine, along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you, did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No, <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this, this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 30 three, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. What's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> it's just a few of them, you know? Just a few. While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Thank you. So excited to have this crab And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's, it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So, 
besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's crab cake recipe? Oh, Sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> He doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up salty. Saltines. Broken salty, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the fine. big and ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. 
By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There's more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole East Coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. How they biting today? This morning it looked pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and have nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, I'll be 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance for more black watermen. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next an up-and-coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. 
These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that, and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side, and pretty much I've um, always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food, so learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watching my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then, the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line Hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in, in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was it was just may it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Hi. Natasha. My big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that uh, people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know. Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crab. NBC News, streaming free now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. 
to look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. Were you able to add a little? Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix the dish, well, "What did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this?" And I would tell him. I said, "You don't have to follow to the letter. You know, put your own spin." And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius. The ingredients simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron. I've got rubber gloves on. All right, patience ready. So, how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so, first, what you want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So, for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just got to see if there's any shells and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh, uh, container. There you go. So, Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. So, we're going to drizzle a little bit at a time. Because I don't want to put too much. Right. Just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's, she's stay by me. I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about you know when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Gonna start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a, a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on, on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand. Kind of street food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's, it's very popular, other than the taste as well. Right. Well, exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah, because you can take it with you, but if it's not right, tasty, right, exactly. you uh, come back for it. Yeah. So what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a, a quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. They're gonna sit in the middle. Is that too yeah. much? Yeah, we wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> Alright, so that's perfect right there. Right, perfect, sorry. perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. What is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Yeah. Lord, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! That faster than what I did. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You have to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore 
uh, kind of important? Pretty much my, my story. Uh, I think that connects very well to our Baltimore, you know, because, you know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life. And I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that. And it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore. And they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and Chris around the edges and then things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't uh -huh. fry on one particular side too much. And uh, just want to even fry. Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made. And this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> So the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and I try the piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Chef Alex, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake, tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family. Welcome to our Today All Day Special. Today loves football. I'm Craig Melvin. With the football season underway, we've teamed up with NBC Sports to highlight some really amazing stories from all over the country that have one thing in common, football. Our first story takes us to the streets of South Los Angeles where a group of coaches is inspiring kids on and off the field. And it all started back in 2011 when the LAPD started pulling kids from rival gang territories in Watts onto the football field to ease neighborhood tensions. And here we are, a full decade later, and that team is still making an impact, providing once-in-a-lifetime opportunities to children from disadvantaged backgrounds. They even starred in an NFL campaign. Here's NBC News correspondent Jacob Sobroff with their story. Today, Nothing else matters. They open the season alongside Aaron Donald as the stars of the NFL's kickoff campaign. I got my back. I got your back. They finished it watching the same Aaron Donald seal the deal for their home team in a dramatic Super Bowl win. Started in 2011 by the LAPD as a way to engage the community, the Watts Rams bring over 100 Watts children ages 8 to 14 together playing football four days a week. My name is Aaron Thompson. I'm a uh, Los Angeles police officer and I'm also uh, head coach of the Watts Rams. Coach Z has been policing in Watts for over 25 years. An area just 8.2 square miles, it has the highest concentration of gangs in all of LA. Kids are forced to make hard decisions yes. at 9, 10, 11. Coach Z offers a different option for kids. This program is about discipline, period. Started with just 30 players, the team took off in 2017 when the LA Rams got involved, providing uniforms, player mentoring, a state-of-the-art field, and once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. You're the star of a national television commercial. <laughs> yeah. How does that feel? Feels, <laughs> feels amazing. I mean, I would have never thought this opportunity would have came my way. So, I mean, when I seen it, I was like, wow, it's crazy. It's amazing, really. This year, as part of the NFL's We've Got Your Back campaign, the stakes were raised. The NFL is going to give all of you the chance, the chance to earn your way to Super Bowl 56 at SoFi. <laughs> they ran with the opportunity, the team making it all the way to the championship, playing at SoFi Stadium. And then... Just wanted to surprise y'all and let you know that I got probably about 19 tickets, something like that, for y'all to go to the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. 
I'm shaking right now because like I'm 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 right here with Odell, so like I'm right here with you. We caught up with them just as they were headed to the game. Five months ago, I saw you guys. You guys saw yourself in an NFL commercial for the first time. Then the coach told you, if you earn your way to the Super Bowl, right. you guys can get on a bus like this and go go do it. You guys, you guys got it. Exactly, because yeah. you know we made sure that our grades stayed where they were supposed to be. Um, we just kept, uh, we stayed disciplined, and um, I mean, we got them. You know, like this is just an honor, a blessing, just to go to the Super Bowl. We met the Watts Rams five months ago. Now they're headed to their once in a lifetime experience, the Super Bowl. Bye, guys. Then. With their brand new Super Bowl jerseys, they enjoyed the entire Super Bowl experience. We ready! Including a storybook finish. A once in a lifetime moment. Man, saying those kids had an experience of a lifetime is an understatement. And moving on to the six-time Super Bowl champion New England Patriots. The team, of course, a football powerhouse. But did you know there's another team in Boston that's just as dominant? Chanel Jones has more. They are New England's football dynasty. Touchdown, Patriots! No, no, the other one. Six championships? Check. The greatest quarterback in league history, check. A star-wide receiver and a league MVP, you guessed it. Meet the Boston Renegades, champions of the Women's Football Alliance, the largest women's tackle football league in the world. Everything's the same. The only difference is we don't need the cups. You are no longer in Kansas, you are in Boston. The Renegades' success hasn't come easy. It wasn't always like this. We've built that culture. Come on, defense. I know it was one of you guys. And now when rookies come in, they know that they're coming into a six-time national championship team. How would you describe the Boston Renegades? I would say family first and just a, a tenacious attitude. Long before they could break tackles, they had to break the mold. These athletes started playing when football had few options for women. I've been playing football since I was three years old, so for, so for my whole life. It definitely wasn't an all-girls team, and it really started like in the neighborhood with my brothers. With the beloved Pats, Bruins, Red Sox, and Celtics making Boston a title town, the Renegades are earning their own part of that glory and attention from that fierce fan base. For her second touchdown of the game. But this football is all passion, no pay. Practicing on nights and weekends after working their day jobs. I was born in Boston. Like star defensive back Shantae Bonds, who teaches high school math. Tell me about some of the athletes that you play with. What kind of commitment do they have? We're doing this three days a week after work hours and then on the weekends. It's a huge commitment. Let's go home, tweet. They're either full-time work or they're in school. Every hour outside of that, they're dedicating to their craft, which is really their passion. And this July, with the Renegades chasing a record sixth title, they got a surprise call from the sidelines. If you wish, we'd like the privilege of flying you on our Patriot team plane. What a champion. We found out today that Bob Kraft and the Patriots want to fly us to the game. For the team, that meant not just the cool factor of taking the Patriots' private plane, but an opportunity to bond after being separated during the pandemic. We started the season not even being able to all be in the locker room at the same time. We didn't have after parties, after games, where those times off the field where you get to know your new teammates and bond with the old ones. So for that championship weekend to just be all of us in the same place, it just made up for all of those opportunities that we missed prior. The Renegades will start chasing their fourth straight title in the spring. But their visibility is just as important as their victories. Women's tackle football is growing tremendously, and it's because now we have little girls that are seeing women play at the highest level. There's tons of women playing football. Like we just might not be on the ESPN top 10, but we're out there and we're working hard and trying to grow the game and, and commit to it what it deserves. Growing the game for the next generation of girls who will suit up on Sundays. All those little girls out there who want to play, support them. Let them play. All they want to do is play a sport. If a girl has a desire to do something, that means she has the ability. 
All that means is we need to nurture it. Here's the thing. The Renegades have just capped off their second straight undefeated season to go along with a fourth consecutive championship. And in early August, they were invited by Patriots owner Robert Kraft to celebrate those milestones on the field at a preseason game at Gillette Stadium. Coming up next, star cornerback Joe Hayden teaming up with special athletes to give them the surprise of a lifetime. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. To look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. NBC News, streaming free now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Start today. NBC News, streaming free now. Welcome back to our Today Loves Football special here on Today All Day. A traumatic childhood event created a special bond between former Pittsburgh Steeler Joe Hayden and his brother Jacob. Jacob has a cognitive disorder that affects his ability to communicate verbally, but that hasn't slowed him down. He shares his brother's talent for sports, competing as a Special Olympic athlete. And NBC News' Morgan Radford sat down with Joe to hear his message of hope for Special Olympians all over the world. How does it feel every time you step on this turf? So much tradition. <laughs> so much tradition. Joe Hayden knows his responsibility to the town of Pittsburgh as a star cornerback for the Steelers. But he wants to use his success to lift up another group. The two-time pro bowler is the first NFL player to serve as a global ambassador for the Special Olympics. We can learn so much from them. It doesn't cost to be nice to people, basically. Um, everybody, just a just to, they give me a perspective on life of just being nice to the next person. And if that's what everybody does, then it's going to be a whole lot nicer world. Hayden learned that perspective at home. His little brother, Jacob, who was born with a cognitive disorder that affects his ability to speak, is also a Special Olympian. What has he taught you? Just, I couldn't imagine not being able to talk to people, you know, and uh, just getting frustrated when people don't understand what I'm saying. And he's always just so happy, always so chipper, always wants just the best for everybody else. Inspired by his brother, Joe set off to fight for those like Jacob around the world, including a trip to Abu Dhabi in 2019 for the Special Olympics World Games. He and his teammates have also hosted some of Pennsylvania's Special Olympians at Heinz Field. Number 23, Joe Hayden. And just a few weeks ago, he delivered the surprise of a lifetime when he told eight athletes and their families that they were selected to represent Team Pennsylvania at the 2022 USA Games. I'm very excited to let you know that Team PA picked you to be on the bowling team. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm excited. <laughs> no doubt, bro. How did that feel to be able to make that call? It makes me just very, very happy inside. They make you realize what sport is about, you know, just the passion to be able to play, being able to have fun with your friends. And uh, I just, I get so much out of it, man. I had so much fun doing that. Joe's passion to help coming from a brotherly bond with Jacob that started early. And you've always been pretty protective of him, mm -hmm. I understand. And when you were younger, you actually saved his life. Mm -hmm. When Joe was nine years old, four-year-old Jacob was drowning in a relative's pool when his big brother dove in to save him. I jumped in, um, 
pushed him up, tried to swim, grabbed him, and swam to the three feet where I called my grandma, my aunt. The helicopter came, he was airlifted out. When was the moment where you said, my brother's gonna make it? I just didn't want to believe that my brother wasn't gonna be there, you know, so um, I just kept faith. Did that change your relationship? Oh, big time, big time. You know, we always were very, very protective of my brothers. My dad, I'm um, the oldest, like he always just look after your brothers, look after your brothers. It just gave me perspective, you know, like I said, always life is too short and uh, just be there for your family. A family that has taught him his greatest lessons off the field. Growing up and throughout your years in the NFL, what has your relationship with your brother Jacob meant to you? What does it mean to you? It means everything, you know. Him watching me and all my brothers go through uh, Little League football, high school football, college football, coming into all my games in the NFL, and just being so supportive. He's just never upset he's not playing. He's just always happy to see us play. That's something that it hits me every time I see him. He's at the games and just the happiest person to see me out there playing. While Joe is no longer with the Steelers, his work's still making a huge impact. It's really great to see him out there paying it forward as well. Up next on Today Loves Football, how the NFL helped one California town work its way back to normal after one of the worst disasters in the state's history. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just weekend. feel good to be back to it school? It does. Yes. Start today. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just weekend. feel good to be back to it school? Does. Start today. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Three years ago, the town of Paradise, California, was severely damaged by wildfires. Thousands of homes were destroyed. Residents were displaced. NBC News' Steve Patterson has a look at how football and the San Francisco 49ers helped folks there work their way back to normal. There's a well-known secret to understanding the spirit of a place like Paradise. Good. It's best found under the bright lights of Friday night. Where church is a gridiron and the opening sermon is always performed by Johnny Cash. You can run on for a long time. For a long time, since the early 1950s, the blessings of hard knock high school football have been part of the tapestry of paradise. Under legendary coach Rick Prince, 10 league championships in the past 22 seasons alone. And in 2018, the Bobcats were poised for another run until the morning of November 8th. Everyone lost their home, you know, 90% of the people I knew. On that day, the campfire became the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California history. Wiping out nearly 14,000 homes in a matter of hours, 85 lives lost. The town was obliterated, but miraculously, after the smoke cleared and the embers cooled, Coach's house was still standing. 
Friday morning after the fire, I said, if our house is there, that's a sign that God wants me to stay here. Paradise, once nearly 30,000 strong, was down to a population of just over 2,000. Nearly every coach and player homeless. Then, just four days after the fire, the San Francisco 49ers hosted the team for their Monday night game. It was the spark they needed. I had a meeting, we had 12 players at the meeting, and I told them, we're having football no matter what. Without jerseys, helmets, facilities, or even a football to throw around, coach called for practice. I wanted to give them some hope, and maybe me a little bit of hope too. In the fall of 2019, hope returned in full. The first game flooding the stadium with more than 5,000 fans, a revival of town and spirit. That night especially brought true hope to the town. It brought hope to those who um, want to come back and rebuild. I walked out of here after the first home game. People wouldn't leave. People were crying. They were hugging. The Bobcats won. Paradise won. LA Times sports columnist Bill Plasky was so inspired by that night, he's been back several times to write a book on the town and team. Kids told me, we can't build houses, we can't build roads, we, we've lost everything, but we can play football. I've been with these guys since I was like seven years old, so it feels happy. Through both the fire and the COVID-19 pandemic, even though his family was forced to relocate to San Diego, running back Tyler Harrison chose to stay, bunking with friends and coaches, remaining dedicated to paradise and the team. What does this team mean to you? What does this team mean to each other? It's family. Like, we're, we're out here together every single day. This is like the second home to me. This year, the team is back to dominating, but paradise itself still has a long way to go. Former Mayor Greg Bolin played, coached, and for the past 20 years has run the chain gang for the Bobcats. He's also using his construction company to help rebuild the town. 70 homes so far. So what keeps you going? I had a 70 year old guy. He says, Greg, the fire was the worst thing we've ever been through. But he said, for the first time in my life, I have a brand new home. Never had that before. It's got to feel good. Yeah. In three years, 1,000 homes have been rebuilt, the spirit of paradise becoming legend. Sunday, the 49ers hosted the Bobcats once again, presenting them with a symbolic jersey and honoring them during the national anthem. You can see it in the eyes of everyone in town. An aura of resilience in the face of adversity. Here, they call that Paradise Strong. Coach Prince announced he would not be returning for the 2022 season. After 23 years, he is retiring as the program's winningest coach. Coming up, Al Roker joining forces with the Baltimore Ravens to surprise a very special high school principal and her really deserving students. NBC News, streaming free now. Hi everybody, good morning, welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Start today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Don Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. Our buddy Al Roker headed down to Maryland to meet one of Baltimore's finest principals and to give her the surprise of a lifetime. Ravens 
M&T Bank Stadium to honor one of Baltimore's finest principals, Dr. Taisha Swinton Buck of Digital Harbor High School. In fact, she just won Maryland's Principal of the Year. We're going to meet her and her students in just a moment. But first, we want to show you how Dr. Swinton Buck is leading her students with love, devotion, and TikTok. Rise and sparkle. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Don't start no trouble this morning. Okay, morning. And sparkle is what Dr. Taisha Swinton Buck, principal of Digital Harbor High School, does best. Miss Swinton Buck, she always greets her students with a lot of love. I feel like she has taken care of me like I'm actually her own daughter. Principal Swinton Buck is the best principal in the world. If you don't like her, I don't know what's wrong with you. Hey, Noah. I like that haircut. Zipping down the hallway with her trademark sparkly shoes and mask and portable music system. Any special requests? Yeah, I know I like the 90s. Posting TikToks. So many TikToks. If it's up, then it's up, then it's up, then it's up. I know that people laugh about the TikToks, but kids get into that. And if I could draw you in that way, then by any means necessary, I'm going to do it. Let's go, let's go. Don't be late, be great. Since Dr. Swinton Buck became principal three years ago, <laughs> Digital Harbor High has been setting records in attendance, grade performance, and graduation rates. I recognize that it's on me to research what this generation needs as learners, as well as just the whole child and their whole experience. Like a free barber shop for its students. That is something that really changed the scope of how our students show up, especially our young men. They also set up a free resource room stocked with personal care and household items that any student can get discreetly. If students' needs are not met in other places, that shows up in the classroom. And so I want to be able to bridge those gaps for students in any way that we need, for them and their families, so that they can show up as their best selves. And while talking about her students, she just beams. My kids are resilient. They are persistent. They are just, you know, a beacon of light for me. I love my students. <laughs> and it's clear they love her. Hey, you okay? Hey, Justin, you got to put your mask up. You feeling better? What happened? Even the teachers at Digital Harbor get emotional talking about her. She has the ability to bring out the best in each individual. She's everything that the school was meant to do when we set out to do it. Um, it's life changing. And lives are changing all around this school. Like for Duane Honeyblue, who Dr. Swinton Buck calls one of her comeback kids. It was a big difference in how it came from like bad grades to like failing classes to passing classes. Duane now envisions a future working in real estate. He said, Dr. Swinton Buck, when I make it, I'm gonna make sure that I tell people, you made me cry. <laughs> um, he said, when I make it, I'm going to make sure people know that you were the person that helped me. The thing that meant so much to me about what he said was that he saw his success. Because when kids can see their success, that's the turning point for them. A turning point for students, a school, and a community inspired by a principal with sparkling shoes and a personality to match with a huge heart. Just a principal of the year for the great state of Maryland. And she has her sparkle shoes ready to roll. Please welcome Principal Taisha Swinton Buck and the fantastic students of Digital Harbor yeah. High School. Okay. Oh. Doctor, how are you feeling tonight? I'm feeling fantastic. When you, when you hear these kids talk 
about that, uh-huh. about how you've inspired them, and also your staff members, how you've inspired them. How does that make you feel? Um, it makes me feel really, really good. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. I'm just humble and grateful to stand in this moment with them and have this memory because they deserve it. Well, well, Dr. Swinton Buck, we want you and your students and your school to keep being a success story. So we have a little surprise for you. Are you ready? I think so. Okay, here we go. Every student at Digital Harbor High is getting a free Dell laptop. (laughs) And you get to keep this. And you guys get internet access for a year. That's right. Thank you so much. This is all provided by our parent company, Comcast. But hold on, there's more. Your school is getting 1,400 laptops, and Comcast is going to give away another 1,600 laptops to school programs throughout Baltimore. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. So, in all total, that's 3,000 computers, that's our so awesome. largest computer laptop giveaway wow, ever. Wow, thank what you is, so what much. What does this mean for your community? Oh, it means everything to us. At Digital Harbor High School, we're focused on technology. Um, computers kept us connected during the COVID closure, and so we're so happy that we can continue on trend. With Digital Harbor High School, technology, we're going to stay focused. Right, James? Yeah. Oh, that's all right. right. How are you guys stay feeling? Focused. Dr. Swinton Buck has transitioned to a new role now, leading and supporting 12 principals in Baltimore City Public Schools. Wow. Impressive, right? Thank you so much for joining us for our Today Loves Football special. And for more inspiring stories centered on all things football, tune in to Today All Day, all season long. Ask most people, they'd say reaching the NFL would be a career pinnacle, the top of the mountain. But for my guest today, the NFL was just the beginning. As a linebacker who played on three pro teams, retiring in 2015, Emmanuel Acho was just getting started. Turns out Emmanuel's calling was off the field in missionary work, and more recently, social justice. Just under two years ago, Emmanuel decided to create and host an online video series of conversations about racism called Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. It's since been viewed more than 80 million times and went on to win an Emmy in 2021. And now Emmanuel is setting out to help others find meaning in their lives. Emmanuel, what a pleasure it is to have you on Making Space. I feel like you are our perfect guest because you are somebody who follows uh, a part of you that isn't always your intellect, it isn't always your pro-con list. You go with something that is beyond that. Since you were a kid, let's go back, let's go back. Since you were a kid and you were making decisions on where to go, what to do, what led you? I've never been asked that question before. I am led by my convictions. And so when when I say conviction, what what do you mean? I'm led by some innate inner yearning to move, to act, to go. Um, That's truly what led me. It's my convictions. And so if I ever feel convicted to move in a certain way, a certain direction, that is the manner in which I go. Sometimes it makes no practical sense at all. Um, But I just feel like you have to move by convictions. I mean, look, when you're a kid, you don't know what the risks are. There are no risks. You jump off the swing, you jump off, you'll realize later that that hurt. But you're free because you don't know the risks. It's like someone who's never had their heart broken. They fall in love harder. How did you manage to keep that even though you've been through disappointments, things that hadn't worked in your life? What was it, Um, Michael Jordan, uh, who said like, I missed so many thousands of shots um, but nobody ne- necessarily remembers the misses. It's Babe Ruth, who I believe said, your next strikeout only brings you closer to your next home run. I don't try to focus on my failures. The only true failure is in not getting up. The only true failure 
is in not trying harder. I was thinking about it the other day um, after I failed at something recently, and I was like, I didn't fail, I fell. And as long oh. as I get up, I win. I love that. You're the, you're the child of immigrants. By the way, um, I have to let you know that when I was in third grade, I went to school in Ibadan, Nigeria for a year. My dad was a professor there. Yeah, we really? went to school. Yes, we have <laughs> such fond memories. It was just a year as the child of immigrants. I, and I'm a child of, of immigrants, too. I feel like there's something different that's in us. What did your parents give to you that led you to the man who you are today? Well, when you travel the world and you see other parts of the world, your mind and the aperture of your understanding is just so opened. What did my parents give me? A certain resiliency. I just learned a different type of resilience. I learned a different type of understanding of how blessed we are in America. You don't really understand the American dream until you realize the nightmare is somewhere else. And I've just lived other countries' nightmares. And so I, I, I understand a difference in a dream. And you've lived the American dream too, boy. <laughs> Did you feel like this feels like my mountaintop? You know, I didn't. The NFL was truly amazing. It was amazing. But unless you are in the top five percentile, the NFL, it too is scary. The reason I didn't feel like it was my mountaintop, I knew the NFL was a means to an end. Hold on, I like answering questions in story form. I vividly remember fearing I was going to be released every day I was in the NFL. The NFL, you have 53 people on a roster. Essentially, you have 53 employees. I was probably the 47th to the 53rd person on the roster as far as importance. Every Tuesday of an NFL week is when you get paid. So if you are on the roster on Tuesday, you know you are going to receive a check that week. So that means by Monday night, you likely will be released if you are going to be released. I was cut in the NFL five times before the age of 25. Imagine being hired at a job out of college, then being transferred across the country from that job, then being fired by your employer who transferred you, and then being rehired and fired and rehired and fired and rehired and fired five times all by the age of 25. So the NFL to me was, it was so taxing. It was so anxiety uh, heavy. The NFL was not a highlight of my life. Oh, wow. Why did you stay in it as long as you did? In the NFL, if you play for four years, you're vested pension and you have annuity. And so the NFL was practical. I was like, okay, play four years. You have all the benefits. As soon as I hit four years, I was like, it is time to get out of here. So it was an easy decision. Simple. Not at all. Not easy. Why? Because the NFL, it cripples every one of your abilities besides playing sports. That's what nobody tells you. Imagine you graduate with a degree, which, by the way, is already hard if you're trying to make it to the NFL because playing college sports is a full time job. But imagine graduating with a degree. Then whatever degree you graduate with, you have to put on ice for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or ten years. So all of that knowledge which you have acquired is now gone to waste because you have been sitting here trying to play in the NFL. So transitioning is near impossible because it's all you've ever known. Every August, think about this, for 20 consecutive years, really 17, from when I was eight years old until I was 25 years old, every August I was wearing a football helmet. Then you wake up one August day and you're not putting a helmet on. It's, it's depressing, it's saddening. You go into dark places. You talked about how you stayed in the NFL for four years so you could get vested, you could get this. You, to me, if I'm listening to you and not knowing anything about you, seem like a very logical guy. I love that your book is called Illogical because it really, there is something beyond a pro-con list in life. What kept you kind of jumping in the deep end, even if you knew the odds were against you? Our greatest accomplishments in life, our greatest accomplishments in life come on the other side of our logic. So what is keeping me from my destiny? And that's really the way in which I operate. The, the scariest phrase that can ever be uttered is that's the way we've always done things or that's the way I've always done things. And I just understand that 
our greatest accomplishments, my greatest accomplishment, your greatest accomplishment, I guarantee it'll come on the other side of my logic. So how can I be more illogical? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. This is so healthy. Doesn't it just feel good to be back to school? Yes. Start today. Top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. NBC News, streaming free now. I love that, you, which you just dovetailed nicely into your uncomfortable conversations with a black man. I mean, this is something that you felt a burning desire to do. People told you it was not a good idea. They said no. People close to yes, me. Yes, you're. But this is, this is, yes, imagine you're an athlete and you ask your coach what you should do, and your coach says, don't do something. Imagine you are a child and you ask your parent what you should do, and your parent says, don't do something. But, I had a calling, and what I realized, Hoda, is my calling wasn't a conference call. Hmm. Uh, my calling was my calling, and only I got that calling. Nobody else heard what I heard, and it wasn't audible. It was within my own soul, my own spirit, if you will. How did you know that this was not something to ignore? I knew it was not something to ignore because I didn't have the luxury of ignoring it. What lives were going to be lost because of my lack of speech? And I think we all eventually have to ask ourselves that question. And it might not be a literal loss of life like a death, but what dream won't be fulfilled because I'm too afraid to act because I'm so bound by logic. It might be my own dream. It might be a community that I might change. It might be a family that I might impact. It might be a neighborhood. It might be a city. It might be a religious gathering. But like, who am I costing because mm -hmm. of my lack of courage? So many people ask me, Hoda Emanuel, how do you find your calling? Mm -hmm. And after pausing and thinking, I said, your calling will call you. Just pick mm -hmm. up. So many people are searching left and right. I don't know what my calling is in life. I don't know what my purpose is in life. I don't know what I'm meant to do. Yo, your calling will call you and it probably already has. You're just not picking up. My calling literally called me. Matthew McConaughey, he called me from a no caller ID number after my first episode of Uncomfortable Conversations got 25 million views. I picked up, Acho, McConaughey speaking. I want to have a conversation. I was like, what? Ma Matthew McConaughey? <laughs> um, he's like, yeah, I want to have a conversation. I was like, okay, well, we'll record episode two in four days. True story. I did not want to do another episode of Uncomfortable Conversations because of how big the first one was. McConaughey says, let's record it tomorrow. After McConaughey calls me, I get another call from a no caller number, uh, caller ID number. Hi, Emmanuel. Oprah Winfrey speaking. Uh, Oprah? Like, <laughs> Oprah, Oprah? Emmanuel, what is is your intention she asked me uh, which yeah um, what you say that's good I, I said Oprah my intention is to change the world and I truly believe I can all of that to say to those listening your calling will call you you just have to make that a logical decision to pick up my calling was a literal no caller ID calls but other people's calling will just be that internal yearning and that internal desire to do something that just seems a little crazy now tonight with Joshua Johnson Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. 
to look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. You know, they say that when you find your calling, you, it's like you're riding a wave. Your whole life you swim upstream and all of a sudden you find the thing that you're supposed to be doing and suddenly you feel like all of the forces of the universe are taking you in the way you're supposed to be going. You're on this ride. Do you feel like that's what's happening or are you swimming up? Man, what's interesting, when you say riding a wave, I think there's inher an inherent sense of ease that seems like yeah. it comes with that. I do believe your calling is what you're made for and your career is what you're paid for. Uncomfortable conversations is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Uh, so I can't say that I'm riding a wave yeah. because it's just so incredibly difficult. But your calling is just what you're made to do. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it is a detour. And uncomfortable conversations was a detour. It was not my destination. Illogical was my destination. Mm -hmm. um, living a life and encouraging people to live their best life, that was my destination. I got my master's degree in sports psychology. So talking about, hey, let's all achieve the dreams we so desperately desire. That was my destination. Hoda, I just had to take a quick detour um, for the, for the <laughs> betterment of those around me. I was reading a book and they were talking about how that in this big field there was one wildflower growing and that everything on God's earth knows exactly what it is supposed to do without being told or thought out. That wildflower wasn't meant to be famous or popular or make lots of money. That wildflower is meant to bloom in the middle of that field, face the sun and make us all feel good. That was its purpose. And they said how people were the only thing in God's earth who don't really have to, have to sort of figure it out or spend our lives trying to be more like this one. I'm gonna yeah. be like Oprah, I wanna be like Denzel. Yeah. I wanna take a page from that. How is it that you were able to find, because it sounds like you have your voice, how did you find it and how do you think people can find it? Because everyone wants to look like that one, dress like that one, be like that one. It's in realizing that you have to be yourself because everybody else is already taken. Mm. And what I've realized is just, I have to be the best version of me. And the what you said is so wonderful about the wildflower. I think the problem we all collectively have as humans is we all have this innate desire to want to be like somebody else instead of simply being the best version of ourselves. Mm. And that is when I talk about like, it's just conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom says we should all do X, we should all do Y, we should all do Z, we should all go to high school, then we should all go to college, then we should all get a job, then we should all get married, then we should all have kids, and we should all live in a house behind a white picket fence. And the problem is, conventional wisdom is limiting all of us, in my greatest opinion. Conventional wisdom is limiting us from the life that we all deserve to be living. And I just finally said, wait a second, why am I going to live inside of someone else's box? Why am I going to let 
insignificant people have such significance in my life. Clearly, faith is front and center with you. It comes out in almost every single answer that you are giving me. Sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's subtle, but it's always there. Um, how has your faith played in, uh, in this journey of yours? My faith has driven me in this journey. And what I believe is we all have faith. The question is, when you sit down in a chair, you have faith that that chair is going to hold you up. Mm -hmm. So we are all, to some degree, people of faith. My faith drives me because... One, I understand what I've put on this earth to do, and it's just to touch lives, it's to, to share the good news, it's to, to talk about Jesus when I can. Um, but more than that, or not more than that, but in alongside with that, faith can be illogical. <laughs> like, like, that's what people don't understand. Like, whether it is, think about this for a second. Noah was commissioned by God to build a boat and put every animal on it because there was going to be a flood. Hoda, can you imagine how many people saw Noah building every day saying, bro, what the heck are what you doing? Up, right, like you right. are a fool until he looks out of the window and he puts his head up into the sky and then he, get, he feels it between his brows, smack dab, it's the first drop of rain. Mm. And the first drop of rain tells him that the flood is coming. And I have a chapter actually titled The First Drop of Rain because when you've been illogical, when I've been illogical, that first drop of rain is going to hit. And when that first drop of rain hits you, that is when you know the flood is coming. So what was my first drop of rain? That call from Matthew McConaughey. Hmm. The call from Matthew McConaughey, I hadn't yet written a book. I hadn't yet heard from Oprah. I hadn't yet been a bestseller. I hadn't yet won an Emmy. I hadn't yet done anything besides a video. But when McConaughey called, that was my first drop of rain, and that was the signal that the flood is coming. So when you make that illogical decision, whether it's be building a boat, whether it's uh, sitting in front of a camera, whether it's starting a business, as soon as you get that first drop of rain, you know the flood is coming. And my faith literally moves me in life because it, it mm. is testaments like that. Wow, that is absolutely beautiful. And I know you your book, Illogical, you say that's your calling, like that's what you're meant to do. You're meant to help, you're meant to heal, you're meant to encourage and cheerlead. I mean, that's so in your DNA. But there are a bunch of people, many people, and we've all been there ourselves too, if we're not there right now, it's you're lost. Like things aren't working for me, you know, and they're trying to figure out how to get up, how to pull up. Um, I know you've, you've got your faith and you've also got your sports psychology degree. You've got a lot going for you, but how, how do you speak to someone like that? Well, the first thing I would do is just encourage them that it's okay to not be okay. Mm -hmm. Like, it's okay to be down for a little bit. The reason a mountain has peaks is because it has valleys. Mm -hmm. If there were no valleys, then everything would just seem like flat and level ground. Mm -hmm. So the valley is actually what dictates the peak. Um, I would also say that your time is coming but mm -hmm. you too have to make your time come. They say luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You can't win the lotto unless you buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. So you can sit there and hope and pray all you want to win the lotto, but you can't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. So are mm -hmm. you buying tickets? I could hope and pray all I want and wish to change the world, but it was sitting down in front of the camera that led to uncomfortable conversations. It took action. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. 
Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now, everyone who I've ever interviewed um, loves the high moments in life, but that's not obviously where they learn anything. They learn things on their on their deepest valleys. What was your deepest valley? My deepest valley. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um, remember, I was in Philadelphia. I was drafted to the Cleveland Browns in 2012. In 2013, the Philadelphia Eagles, they traded for me. I was now in Philadelphia, but remember, I told y'all I was cut five times by that organization. One of the final times I got cut, and what people don't realize about the National Football League, when you get cut, they instantly remove your access from the building. You can no longer go into the building for anything, from a Gatorade shake to a workout to anything. I lived in Philadelphia. I lived very close to the Rocky Steps, but I still wanted to continue playing. So true story. After I got cut, I believe it was the second to last time, I would have to go to an abandoned field to work out. I showed up one day and the field is covered in nothing but pigeons. I didn't have bags. In, in football, you need a bags about five feet long and one foot high to just do different drills over. You might need to hop over the bag. You might need to sprint in front of a bag, then backpedal behind another one. Just do different uh, drills. I didn't have bags, so I had to steal street cones, construction orange street cones. So now imagine, I used to be this NFL player on Monday, but on Tuesday, I'm in an abandoned field, shooing pigeons off of the field, stealing construction cones, laying these construction cones on this field that has, was once overrun by pigeons, and I'm working out by myself, knowing that 20 minutes across town, all of my teammates and my best friends are there. Those were the lowest moments of my life. Man, I kept it up until I got another call, and the Eagles called me back, and they signed me again. But then I broke my thumb, uh, and after I broke my thumb, I'm having surgery, and I knew, I knew one of two things. If they had to put pins in my thumb, the Eagles were going to release me, because if they put pins in my thumb, I could not play, because pins protrude from the skin, so you can't put a bandage on it and play with it. If they put screws in my thumb, I could still play, because with screws, you could put a club on your hand and still play. So immediately after my surgery operation, I wake up, and I look at the doctor, and all I ask him is, pins or screws because if I if he says pins the Eagles were going to release me for the final time if he says screws then I am still going to be employed I wake up still partially sedated and I just say pins or screws and he says pins um, I start weeping I go to the Eagles facility the general manager meets me at the front door and he says hey Emmanuel coach wants to see you bring your playbook that means you're getting released with my left hand, I now have to pack up my locker for the final time. I have a huge trash bag with tears down my eyes and my hand casted. And for the final time, I left the Philadelphia Eagles facility. It, funny enough, and interestingly enough, for those interested in that story, I lead the book, Illogical. The chapter starts yeah. with pins and screws. Um, pins and so the and very screws. first, the very I first like, chapter is pins and I screws. I feel like God was busy trying to tell you all along that it was time to say goodbye it to football, but to you go. just wouldn't li You weren't listening. Remember you said you got to listen? You were like this, not yet. I need pins or screws. I need oh, to get down to the end. My, I need my was, five times. It was terrible. I but, was like but truly, does, truly terrible. But that does, Emmanuel, bring you to that thing, which, again, I keep going back to, which is how do you know if God's trying to tell you to work harder which is what you were doing all those five times with the, or how do you know if he's trying to tell you pivot time yeah. to pivot now? How do you know when it's time? I think when you have exhausted your emotional, your financial uh, and your spiritual bandwidth, and it's like, you know what, unless this works and if this is not blessed, I am going to move on. You know, just back to your book for a minute, illogical. Um, what do you hope that people, I know there's a lot of great life lessons in there, and I don't even know where to begin with them, quite frankly, because every time I turned a page, I was like, highlighter, highlighter. But there, it's got really good original ideas. But give me a couple that you think that people would like to take away. Along your illogical journey, so many people are going to tell you what you can't do instead of what you can do. Mm -hmm. And you are going to need to block out that noise. So do not ever 
forget your earmuffs. So on your destiny towards being the best version of yourself and living the life of your dreams, you're going to have a might be crazy moment. We already discussed that first drop of rain moment. When you are being illogical, there's going to come a point in time when you have and you experience that first drop of rain, which tells you your, 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 your success is coming. True story. In sixth grade, I was at my friend's house and we were eating burgers. His older brother walked in and he threw something at the table. My dear friend ran from the table and started hiding behind a chair. I was like, what in God's name is going on? I looked at what his older brother threw at the table and it was simply a pack ketchup packet. I cracked it open after checking up my friend and I started eating my fries with some ketchup. At that point in time, I learned a valuable lesson that day, Hoda. Don't be afraid of other people's fears. Ooh, don't be that's afraid good. of other people's fears. And so many of us in life are afraid of other people's fears. Well, well, I'm not going to start a business because my friend was afraid to. Yeah, I'm not going to get in a relationship because my homegirl got cheated on. I'm not going to get married because my, 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 my dad and my mom have never had. I've never seen a successful relationship. I can't leave this city. Nobody in my family has never ever left Austin, Texas. Why would I leave? I refuse to fly on an airplane because so and so is afraid of flying on an air. We're so afraid of other people's fears, not even our own. It's the craziest thing. That We're not even afraid brilliant. of our own fears. The book is called Illogical. It's by Emmanuel Acho. He's got great conversations. You can find him everywhere. You're making your mark. Look <laughs> at you. You're blazing your trail. Get out of your way. Thank you, my friend. Em Emmanuel, thank you. It was, a, it was wonderful talking to you. I enjoyed every second. Likewise. Welcome to Today All Day. All Day? Today All Day. All Day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking, yeah. who's your favorite okay. character you've ever oh, played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things? Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. <laughs> when I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today All Day. A big hello and thanks for joining us for a special edition of Pop Star Plus. I'm Joe Fryer filling in for Carson. Today on the show, we're taking a moment to indulge in the past and revisit our favorite nostalgic summer movies. We're going to take a look at why we feel the way we do when we watch those older summer flicks. And you're killing me, Smalls. Today, contributor Donna Farazin spoke to the cast of a movie that defines the season, The Sandlot. We found out why it still resonates today. And to close out our special show, we've got our friend Chris Witherspoon, founder and CEO of Pop Viewers. He's counting down the most nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. Stay with us for all of that. It'll be great. To kick things off, here's a deep dive into how watching nostalgic films makes us feel, especially during the heat of summer. Summer in itself is a great example of a trigger for nostalgia because it connotes many of the attributes that accompany nostalgia, such as longing for the carefreeness, the leisure uh, of childhood. But when you watch something like a movie that's set at summer camp, you've got so many stimuli there that are reminding us that in our hectic, busy lives, should we not occasionally take a break? So, uh, either of you by any chance know how to play poker? Yeah, never played it before. Roosevelt, how's that lanyard coming? Horrible. Film is a really good example of a medium that has all of the triggers for different kinds of sensory experiences, visual, auditory, such as the music in a film. And so you have all these varieties of sensory stimuli that help you to mentally transport yourself in two ways, by the way. Uh, one, when you're just remembering the past, you're transporting yourself back to that time. An interesting finding recently showed that when people just reminisce nostalgically, they even feel a little more uh, healthy and vibrant and they have more vitality. Why? Because when you transport yourself back, you're feeling a little bit of the feelings you felt when you were younger. Nostalgic films, especially for 
uh, looking back to your beloved favorite uh, childhood movies, those were a source of great comfort. You're killing me, Smalls. Dear Darla, I hate your stinking guts. Their time! Up there! Down here, it's our time! It's our time down here! In fact, in film, for example, we believe from the research data that there are characters in movies that serve as surrogates for us. So when you watch a film that you loved in the past, not only are you remembering when you watched it, with whom did you watch it, the, the uh, conversations you had at the time, maybe you went out to the movies with friends or what have you, but in addition to that, as you watch characters in films play out their own problems and resolve them through this vicarious resolution, you feel that hope and optimism, which is a lot like the happy ending of many stories that we've seen throughout our lives, right? If you wanted to uh, log them according to seasons of the year, for instance, summer is a great time. And uh, what operates as a nostalgic film, it could be something like Star Wars, uh, episode one, for a generation who saw that for the first time, either as children, teenagers, or young adults, and to some extent, it's transporting them, not just to the film and the enjoyment of the film, but also uh, it gives someone the ability to reflect upon, what did it mean to me when I saw that as a kid? And now what, did, what would I think of it now? So sometimes when we rewatch an old film, we're comparing our understanding as full-fledged adults or our understanding now, now that we've lived through so much with what we thought when we first saw it. Also for the elderly today, they might think back to the great summer films that were beach movies. You know, the parties on the beach and playing volleyball on the beach. When you think about transportation uh, mentally through a film, now you have added on to it that you might transport yourself to somebody else's past or to somebody else's experience, not necessarily your own. So uh, fiction can be enjoyed and benefited from even in terms of nostalgia. For instance, a lot of nostalgic films incorporate within the plot or within the character uh, lines, characters remembering back to their past. I can still recall our last summer, I still see it all. Walks along the Seine, laughing in the rain. I was the last one to move away, but when I did, the Sandlot was still there. And then when you watch that, then that prompts you to sort of mentally transport yourself with that character back to their past as well. So it's very rich. Film is a very rich medium. Our thanks to Professor Christine Batcho for sharing all of her findings and insights with us, a little better understanding of why those films make us feel so good. Still to come, even more nostalgia and more fun. Donna Farrison's chat with the Sandlot stars who played Yeah Yeah and Squints. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. We've got each other now. Doesn't it weekend. just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready. SG, you ready? To refresh and reorganize for fall. Start today. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. 
To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to our Pop Start Plus special all about nostalgic summer movies. Now, if you're a 90s kid, you'll remember the 1993 release of a movie about a ragtag pack who loved playing ball. And it changed how we think about summer forever. Today, contributor Donna Farrison spoke to two of the stars from The Sandlot, Chauncey Leopardi, who played Squints, and Marty York, who played Yeah Yeah. They shared the responses they still get about the movie set during a summer back in 1962. Was the summer you filmed The Sandlot the best summer of your life? It was for sure the best summer <laughs> of my life. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anything, you know, compares to it since then. And uh, I think we just had had a blast. It was summer camp for like two or three months that we filmed over the summer. And definitely, definitely the best. Yeah, it was pretty great. It's hard to beat. Um, obviously, you know, I love my family and I wouldn't want my wife to think that, uh, you know, my 11 year old summer was the best summer of my life. But. Uh, it, it was pretty awesome, you know, hanging out with friends and having that experience and then getting to share it with uh, the rest of the world forever. is just a, it's a pretty, a pretty amazing thing. This film represents the best of summer, the 4th of July celebrations, the carnival, kids playing ball, the s'mores, you name it. There's so many different elements. Why do you think The Sandlot is a film that has defined summertime for a lot of people? It takes people back to a to an era of the United States that where kids went outside and they played and when the sun went down, that's when they came, went home. I want you to get out into the fresh air and make some friends. Run around, scrape your knees, get dirty. You had adventures during the day. It'll be 30 years next year, first of all. How does that feel for you guys? It's amazing. I mean, you know, Anytime you do a film, you never know what the results are going to be. But to still be here talking about this 30 years later and to uh, to see it still affecting people's lives for the better is kind of, that's kind of why you're in the arts. You know, it's the, the reason that you want to do. That's what you set out when you, you have passion about a project is to hope that you get one that, that you know, changes things, you know, forevermore. So mm -hmm. it, it's a blessing. And we, uh, we appreciate all the love and support that we've gotten over the years. What were your favorite scenes to film for each of your characters? I loved like all of the baseball stuff, obviously it was a lot of fun. When we played the other team, it was a blast. Filming the whole chase scene, we did that for like two weeks. So just the dog chasing Benny and all the different stuff. That was a lot of fun as well. I think that there's like something to find that was cool about everything. And uh, even in the treehouse stuff, that treehouse was amazing. This is when they really built sets for film still. There was no green screens or or you know, or anything like that. So that was all like real craftsmanship. Somebody, a carpenter, the the uh, the construction guys on set actually built those sets. So they were so cool and like so in depth. Uh, Mr. Myrtle's house, and it was a really cool time in filmmaking because you still had all of the crafts really showing, you know, showcasing their work. Whereas now maybe things are a little bit more reliant on on computer generated software and and stuff like that. So it was a cool time to to kind of see them you know, fabricate this uh, this really cool film and uh, these really cool sets. Obviously, my my favorite scene was going over the fence to come face to face with the beast and uh, being on that crane. And it's really cool because, you know, back then, you know, kids could do their own stunts, which would never happen nowadays. And just like a lot of the stuff that I didn't even see till the final picture came out, the 4th of July scene, you know, we filmed that with just literally lights and gels that they put in front to make it look like fireworks were going off. You know, when we filmed that, it didn't seem that iconic to me until you put Ray Charles to it, until you put the, the fireworks in the sky. And uh, you, when we saw the final product, we were like, wow, like that really like, you know, that's an amazing scene. That was just movie magic. God done shed his grace on thee. What kind of memories do people you know, tell you that they have that are related to the Sandlot. What do the fans come up to you and say? Everybody that relates to Squints that has the glasses or like, you know, I get a lot of the pictures and the photos. Sometimes as growing up, having glasses is always like a, you know, something that people could be a little reserved about or, or feel like they get picked on a little bit. So it's cool to have that, 
that cool character that people can relate to that that makes them feel um, like this is a, a superpower, not 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 the opposite. How do you think the Sandlot has helped empower young people to feel more included, be more inclusive, and you know feel okay to embrace their differences? It's awesome because this is a bunch of uh, kids of all shapes, colors, and sizes. They're all different. They all have their own little their little thing. And you know the main character is a kid that's filling out a place and Dr. coming from somewhere else and really not fitting in. in. And it start 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 and it starts off with like his struggle of like you know, trying to connect with his stepfather and trying to connect with these kids in this well, new neighborhood. And uh, yeah. it takes a guy like Benny, who is obviously a, a very strong character and an amazing baseball player and uh, a total star to just say, you know, leave him alone. We need an extra guy and this guy's, this guy's gonna be it, you know? So it's about including people regardless of, you know, what the, the masses feel. So I think it has a lot to say about, you know, real American values, because that's what America is. It's a melting pot of different cultures and different people that, that you know, find common ground to create a better life for themselves. Really cool to hear from those two. We're gonna share more from them after the break, including what it was like to film that famous pool scene featuring Squints and Wendy Peppercorn. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Are you ready? Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We are going to start with some good news. Doesn't it weekend. just feel good to be back to it school? Does. Yes. This is so healthy. Here's what's happening in your The crowd is ready, SG, you ready? We're fresh and reorganized for fall. Start today. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. NBC News, streaming free now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to our special episode of Pop Star Plus. Let's pick back up with Donna Farrison's conversation with two stars from The Sandlot, Marty York and Chauncey Leopardi, who spoke about that very pivotal pool scene and the impact it's had on young kids today. Chauncey, you were talking about, you know, Wendy Peppercorn and that pool scene, which is so iconic when your character almost drowns and then gets saved by the lifeguard that everyone has a crush on. What do you remember from shooting that scene? God, it looks like a dead fish. Uh, it was really cold. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was a really hot summer, but... Uh, during the time that we shot the pool scene, it had dipped down into like the 70s and we were shooting early mornings for the light and uh, it was freezing cold. So in a lot of those scenes, you can see us like shivering in the pool. Or I know it was like a big anticipation for me leading up to that. I kept asking the director, you know, is today the day, is today the day? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was my first, my first kissing scene. So, you know, wow. pretty exciting. That is exciting. That's amazing. Yeah. Just as we talked about earlier too, so much that has happened or the emotions that are evoked from the Sandlot translate into real life as well. On the Today Show, Hoda recently interviewed the three boys who had saved 
The dad who became unconscious underwater in their pool, it's an amazing story. They performed CPR on him, saved his life, and they credited learning CPR through watching The Sandlot and through that specific scene. Now, who took a CPR class? Raise your hand. Nobody? But you did know because what was one of your favorite movies? The Sandlot. What was your reaction to that news? That's just incredible, you know, like, here we are 30 years later, and, and something that someone saw that we did 30 years ago saved their father's life. I mean, it, it just, it, it makes you want to tear up because it's such a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, wherever we get the information from, it, it's great, you know. So to be the, the, the force that helped them do that for their father, you know, I, I'll never forget it. Every time I come across a fan of The Sandlot, they always talk about it in a way that, you know, they feel so comfort comforted and cozy when watching it. It brings them back to a different time. Why do you think people feel so comforted when watching The Sandlot? It's timeless. The way David Mickey Evans, the writer and director, shot it, he told the DP, Tony Richmond, he told him, I want it to look like Kodak chromatic film. So that's like an old, uh, you know, very pop arty type of film from the from the 60s. And he said, I want it to look like that. And I think because of the setting, had he have done it in the 90s when we shot it and, and placed it present day, I don't think it would have lasted and stood the test of time. It's like a Bel Air, it's like a, a 57 Chevy, you know, it's something that the lines on it are gonna be clean forever. And no matter what, you're always gonna get a nostalgic feeling when you go see these these old cars at these car shows and just the storied time in American history. And be, and because it's it's just frozen in time, I think that it, it, it stands the test of time because it is a time capsule, like Marty said. It just, it takes you to a happy place where, you know, good or bad, we felt like everything was, was a little bit simpler. Thank you to Marty and Chauncey for hanging out with us. Still to come, we've queued up some of the most nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. Do we got any Parent Trap fans out there? Stick with us. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? Hey, Miss Lester. Hey, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline, Missing in America. Listen to the full season now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. News is happening now. A look at what's making headlines around the world. We're coming on the air with breaking news. This is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to our special episode of Pop Start Plus. We are diving into everything you need to know about nostalgic summer movies. And who better to guide us along than Chris Witherspoon? He is the founder. Uh, when it comes of Queen Elizabeth II. So uh, I think an important.